Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Pearson. I'm a director with the Canadian Club. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today, on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We are grateful for this opportunity to be able to come together to learn on this land. Well, we're just days away from the start of the Winter Olympics in Beijing, and we're thrilled to be hosting such a timely discussion on mental health and well-being in sport and business. We're joined by a panel of senior business leaders and Olympic athletes to hear their insights from a personal and a systemic perspective. Before we hear from the panel... I want to review a few housekeeping instructions. Please take note of the following. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. Once you click the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window. That's obviously how to direct questions to our moderator to whom they will be sent. The request help button located in the bottom right corner of the page is for technical support. I want to take a moment to thank our event sponsors for helping to make this possible. Cadillac Fairview, Deloitte and LifeWorks. Thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. Today's event is free of charge. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people together for 125 years. It's because of our sponsors, our partners, and our members that we're able to do so. So we thank you very much for your continued support. Now let me introduce today's speakers. We have Ashley Lawrence, who is a Paris Saint-Germain athlete and Olympic gold medalist. We have Stephen Liptrap, who is the president and CEO of LifeWorks. Calvin McDonald, the CEO of Lululemon and Dr. Haley Wickenheiser, who is the Senior Director of Player Development for the Maple Leafs and an Olympic gold medalist. Today's discussion will be moderated by Kathy Woods, partner and National League Workforce Transformation at Deloitte. Another tradition that our club maintains is the toast we make to our country, which is a little bit odd virtually, but nevertheless, we'll carry on. So if you have a beverage close by, please raise it and join me in a toast to Canada. And now I am delighted to turn um, the event over to Kathy, who will uh, begin our panel. Kathy, over to you. Thank you, Tracy. And I will say good morning from beautiful British Columbia. Um, good afternoon to those of you further east than I am. It really is fabulous to be here. Um, I think this panel is incredible. Um, feeling a little star studded with all of you around me. So thank you so much for joining us. This topic of mental health is one that is really, really current right now. It's, uh, I think the pandemic has made it incredibly top of mind for us. 
We've seen situations with Simone Biles in the Olympics in the summer. Um, in tennis, we've seen these issues pop up from a um, in professional sports, amateur sports, and at that world um, athlete level. We obviously, I think Kelvin and Stephen and I would would attest to the fact that we're seeing these issues in the business world at all levels, from leaders right to uh, through the organization to frontline employees. And I know even from our conversations as we kick this off. We're all experiencing it in different ways um, personally. So nothing more topical, I think, than this. In the introductory video, the Canadian Club talked about discussing issues that matter. And this is clearly an issue that matters. So I know you're all here to hear, hear the panelists. Let's get things going. Um, as I mentioned, this is pretty personal to many of us. And we were sharing some of those stories. So I'd kind of like to start a little bit um, from that perspective and you know, go to Haley and Ashley when the Canadian Club invited you to participate in this panel, I heard that you both jumped at the opportunity. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what made you do that. Why did you accept so enthusiastically? What what attracts you to this topic? And Haley, I see you're off mute on my screen, so maybe I'll toss it to you. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, hi, everybody, uh, wherever you are today in the world. Um, yeah, you know, I... I suppose I see this through a couple of different lenses now. Um, first, as a as a mom of a 21 year old son who's in his third year of uh, university and has uh, had a struggle with uh, the virtual online uh, shift back and forth, and just the challenges that the pandemic has uh, has has given him and and uh, I guess kids like him. Um, secondly, through the lens of uh, of medicine, finishing my residency um, and uh, in family medicine right now. I would say about 80% of the patients that I see have a mental health component related to them at the moment. And, uh, and lastly, as an athlete, um, I think athletes are the most resilient population in the world. And just um, what the athletes, the current athletes, a group that's going to Beijing have had to endure and go through and be able to, to pivot and adapt. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn um, from, from athletes and in sport uh, to equip uh, not only in business, but our kids as well um, to have those skills that, uh, you know, we can thrive and adapt when challenges present themselves. So I think for all of the are the reasons that um, this this topic is always interesting to me, and it's never far from my day to day life. Yeah, and I, I love the comment you made about learning from um, athletes and how resilient you all are, and and the incredible athletes over um, just about to start the Olympics as well. Ashley, what about you? What made you say yes to this? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I definitely agree with. Um, what Haley had mentioned. And I think for me, from my perspective, um, as an athlete, um, it is a, a topic uh, very important to me. Um, I think that uh, recently we've seen a lot of progression in this domain, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, right now I'm in uh, Paris, France, and um, it's a completely different culture in terms of um, mental health. Um, and uh, uh, my experience, firstly, on uh, on Team Canada, on the national team, um, we've been very privileged uh, to form an environment um, where uh, there are resources. There's a lot of um, things that are uh, accessible for us uh, to uh, feel comfortable, to um, express ourselves, and to support one another. And I think uh, I think that. Uh, it, it is vital um, as athletes, as high performers, um, to uh, talk about uh, our experiences. And so, I think that um, the more and more that we can communicate on 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 these topics, um, the more um, others will feel comfortable to share their in their experiences. And so, um, I'm just happy to be here to share um, kind of what I've been through a bit, um, and uh, just to show the importance. Uh, of, uh, of mental health and, um, um, come together. You know, I love your, you sort of referenced that there's a different attitude towards mental health over in Paris and good evening to you, by the way. Um, I think this concept of stigma around mental health is something that we're, we're probably going to have to address. I do think we're really lucky in Canada as we're starting to chip away at that and making it more, um, readily accessible to talk about it and to access support. It's certainly not something that everybody appreciates or, or can benefit from. And, and I know 
uh, speaking with colleagues and clients in Europe as well, it's it's much more challenging in many of the European countries. Um, I'm going to flip a little bit. And Calvin, I'm actually going to go to you because if I think back to the early days of Lululemon and the bags that everybody coveted, where Lululemon started having the sayings on it, almost mantras, which really looked at well-being, I think, holistically. And although you were, you know, known, connected with yoga and the physical well-being, there was much that was on those bags. And I believe I still have some much worse for wear with the sayings on them that really connected with with mental health. So I I look at Lululemon as really pioneering a lot in this space. Um, Maybe you launched a well-being index last winter, which again, pioneering in the space for an organization that's really all about apparel. What made you do that? Maybe talk a little bit about Lulu's perspectives on on, uh, well-being and mental health and talk a bit about that that index. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, Well, the past two years has definitely tested the well-being of everyone like never before, um, based on what we've all experienced. Uh, And as you alluded to at Lululemon, our purpose has been uh, to help all of us realize our full potential. And that starts with being well. Um, And we recognize that we have an opportunity to help drive positive change and create a healthier future. So the the, the, the impetus behind the well-being um, index report was really uh, to be in the conversation, uh, to understand the opportunities uh, around the world in the markets in which you know, we have the privilege of um, working with the local communities on, on how they are feeling. Are they feeling well uh, and, uh, and what the opportunities are and, and what we discovered um, and what the, the, the report exposed is really the paradox of people saying that they feel fine when in actually uh, they're feeling quite fragile, with only 29% indicating a strong well-being across three dimensions that we look at. Um, we believe in uh, physical well-being, emotional well-being, and social well-being. So the power of not just your physical fitness, but your mental, as well as the social and the power of connecting through community and connection with others. Um, so we know and identified uh, that there's a real opportunity. Uh, in particular, uh, we saw that the youth are most vulnerable uh, with Gen Zs scoring the lower, lowest in terms of their mental health, where one in four Gen Zs um, are deeply affected by the issues that are happening uh, today in the world. Uh, and the second is that employers must do more with only 15% of respondents indicating that uh, employers are doing enough to support them uh, in their mental well-being. Uh, so we're geared up to release our second annual next year, and this is something we're committed to doing on an ongoing basis as we can track and monitor uh, the well-being of the communities we're in and obviously helps us to really identify the areas that we can make a greater impact, which is, uh, which is a big part of our uh, motivation. Thanks. And I think um, you have done a great job at making, you know, uncovering, uh, helping to break down some of that stigma and uncovering it. And I think really pioneering with, with these data. And I really, what really resonates with me is that employers need to do more. Um, and certainly as, as a leader at Deloitte, something I think about all the time about what can we be doing more Um, And honestly, the first time somebody on my team went on leave for um, a mental health issue, it it was really, you know, it really rocked me because I thought I was working really hard to do everything. And I think that that sort of aligns a lot, Stephen, with some of the things that you at LifeWorks um, have been working on around mental health, your mental health index, um, leaders and mental health. um, Why don't you chat a little bit about that. And I'm also going to remind our audience, feel free to pop questions in um, as we go along and we'll, we'll get our panelists to answer them too. So Stephen, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And really good to be here and be part of this conversation. It's interesting as I hear Calvin talk about purpose of Lululemon, I think about our purpose around how do we improve lives? And we've got this aspirational target of how do we improve a billion lives around the world? And one of the things that we thought we had a unique ability to do, and we did this about three years before the pandemic, was to create a mental health index. And the theory was we all get reports on the consumer price index every month. We all get reports on the ADP jobs report, but nobody is 
tracking what is happening with mental health in society. And we thought by really digging in and looking at this data, we provide the data to organizations like the great work that Lululemon is doing, um, but also provide it to policymakers. And so we launched the index. Um, we had three years of data, launched it right at the beginning of the pandemic. And we measured the mental health every single month in Canada, US, UK, and Australia. And we're gonna be rolling out to many more countries in the near future. And we found a couple interesting things through the pandemic. First thing I would say is that high risk of people from a mental health standpoint went up from 14% of people at high risk to 34%. So if you think about in our workforces today, in our athletic communities, whatever, a third of people are at high risk today. The second is people who felt like they belonged to something. And when you think about we're now in a Zoom world on a screen all day, belonging decreased from 73% to 65%. So again, one third of people don't feel connected to or belonging to anything. And you think about the implications for that. It could be kids out at school somewhere. It could be people feeling very lonely at home or whatever the case might be. And the one that was probably most stunning to me was if you think about the most vulnerable 8% of the population. So people who are at high risk of anxiety and depression and everything else, that is now the median today. So the median today is equal to the worst 8% before the pandemic. And what we know, if you look at what happened after the world wars, if you know, if you look at what happened after the Spanish flu, all of those things ended and the mental health implications were with us for decades. So we've got to get in front of it, which is amazing to have, you know, these folks uh, talking about it today, you know, hearing Haley and Ashley get out there, hearing Simone Biles, hearing Carrie Price and what they're going through and bringing stigma to the forefront and reducing it is absolutely incredible. I couldn't agree more. And, and um, I'm seeing a few questions coming up in the chat that are, are really interesting, we'll, which we'll get to in a moment. One of the things I want to talk about um, or, or ask about, because I think we've all aligned around how much we're almost at a crisis stage. It's a, it's a major issue. We're talking about it. We've got numbers to show. So what are some of the things that we can do about it and or some of the experiences that we've had that we think have been helpful or not. And this is where I'd like to start drawing some parallels between the sports world and the business world and, and go over to Ashley and Haley. I think about, you know, there's a personal aspect to mental health and it's very influenced by the ecosystem that we operate in, the people we, we play, work, train with, um, the things we're expected to do, the way we do the work. I'd like to hear from your perspective um, a little bit about the impact of your coaching team, your team around you as athletes on mental health and what you've observed from your experience and things that would be real lessons learned that we could take forward. Um, does either one of you want to pick that one up? Go for it, Haley. Sure. I can, I can, I can go first, I guess. Uh, well, I think I'll speak to it from uh, my role with the Toronto Maple Leafs. So the demographic that I spend most of my time with is, is roughly between the ages of 18 and 27 years old. And um, I think the, the Leafs are the first NHL franchise to hire a full-time psychiatrist uh, that works with the staff, with the players day in and day out. And, um, you know, what I've noticed uh, in this experience, so hockey is probably the last bastion of um, pro sport that is resistant to adjust to this, this topic that is, you know, suck it up and deal with it, which is the hockey culture in general has really um, been, been quite terrible at that. And I experienced that myself, not, not because anybody told me to do that, but because through my career, it was felt that if you ever struggled and you said something, you might lose your, your job, your role. There's a lot of fear associated with that. No different than in business. Um, but what I've known, what I've noticing now in, in sort of this new generation is the willing to put these resources out there and to normalize it um, allows uh, players and athletes, and these are young men mostly, to feel comfortable to say, hey, uh, you know, can I chat with ABC and uh, I need some help here? And I've seen it 
countless times actually through this year where that that resource has been tapped into and it's become quite a, a normalized thing whereas you know five ten years ago that was something that would never have existed so it's really it's really come a long way so I think normalizing you know the resources that are out there um uh, you know as as it's been talked about decreasing the stigma around it uh and then just continuing to open the dialogue and and have the two-way communication reassuring people that their jobs and their livelihood is not at stake just because they might suffer an injury that we can't see yeah it's interesting that connects with a question that came up and i mean i love to hear that the leafs are are so um ahead of the, ahead of the game so to speak pun intended um, with hiring the psychiatrist and so on. One of the questions that came up was that with Gen Z scoring, Gen Z, Gen Z scoring lowest um, on the well being index, do we think this may also be indicative that they're more comfortable disclosing issues related to well being and related to mental health? And are we moving the dial in the right way? And Haley, you just talked about really creating an environment where it is, where people are bringing it forward. And I think this would be the generation we're talking about. Any thoughts on that question? And then Ashley, I'll come to you for your experience. Yeah, I would say quickly that I think players of this generation are far more um, open to dialogue. They want to be heard. They want their viewpoint listened to. They want to uh, have a collaborative approach, not a top-down dictated approach. That's what I see in in the young athletes of today, both male and female. They're far more likely to initiate conversation and initiate action. Um, But on the flip side, I also think that especially coming out of this pandemic, we are in a pandemic of another kind, which is an opioid and a mental health crisis. Right, exactly. Ashley, you want to talk about your some of your experiences? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, to piggyback off of just what um, Haley was mentioning, um, uh, the importance of having uh, resources. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier with Team Canada, um, we do have a, a full-time psychologist. Um, and so uh, it makes uh, a world of a difference. Um, for me and for um, other uh, players. Um, I think that uh, continuing to have the dialogue uh, open, uh, we've seen athletes um, from Tokyo, uh, Simone Biles speaking out, um, and more and more athletes um, just uh, showing what what they're going through. And um, I think uh, a lot of that is tied to pressure, um, pressure that is put on them, which is linked to performances and results. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's important to see athletes not only for who they are as an athlete, but who they are as a person. Um, and uh, for us, uh, it's really easy to kind of get um, wrapped up into this routine of um, preparation, um, playing a game or playing in a competition. And then it's just like preparation, preparation. And that's, that's pretty much our main focus. Um, and uh, it is important to have um, leadership, strong leaderships, and that comes down to coaching, coaching staffs, uh, and um, uh, it's really up to them to kind of set um, set the standard, but set really the values of uh, of their team, of that group. Um, and so um, I think that again, um, more and more um, athletes are speaking out, um, and that really is allowing other athletes to feel more comfortable to have that freedom to then share their experiences. Um, and, um, it just allows uh, the situation to, to not kind of be as, as taboo. Um, and so, yeah, I think the more and more that we can, um, continue to kind of explore those methods, um, uh, the better it will be. Um, and again, being in France, it is fairly different. Um, uh, we actually don't have a psychologist with us. Um, and I, and I know that they're, there are a lot of athletes, uh, uh, there's impacts on their performances. Um, and I know that every performance is 80% like mental, um, and like 20% physical. And so, um, it's really important that we go towards, um, these topics, um, explore and talk about, talk about them more and more. Um, but yeah, I think, um, the more that we can do that, the better. So you just talked about, you know, preparation, performance, 80% mental, 20% physical. Um, 
he talked about pressure and there, there are a couple of questions around, you know, one, one person's referencing their daughter who is a, a high level goalie. And whenever she lets her team a goal in, she feels like she's letting her team down. I think about in the work world, the pressure for performance, whatever that performance looks like, whether it's time at work or sales that you've generated or productivity in a shop floor environment. Um, what experiences would you to have? And then I'll turn it over in a minute, and give Calvin and Stephen a chance to chat. But just when you think about the expectations on athletes for performance and how do you manage those because it's so clearly measured whether an athlete performs or not. How do you manage those expectations of performance relative to um, being healthy in terms of the way you prepare, the way you train, and, and then the way you actually perform? Um, yeah, I think, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Ashley. Thank you. Yeah, I think that it really does come down to balance. Um, for myself, uh, of course, uh, I want to perform at the highest level. Um, I want to be ready to perform. Um, but in order to do so, I have to get into the right, I guess, space. Um, and it, it is different for everyone. Um, I think for me, it's beyond the field. Um, being a, a soccer player, um, it's beyond the field. And it's really um, managing um, nutrition, um, getting good sleep, um, my recovery, um, strategies, um, and, and everything around that, that's even beyond soccer. Um, I think, um, it's important to, to recognize, um, there's that aspect, um, but also outlets. Um, uh, it could be a coach, it could be, um, a partner, um, a friend, but having someone there where, um, you can talk, um, you can express what you're going through and, um, for me, I, I, I really just love to, to speak and, um, and to, to kind of say what I'm going through and, um, not necessarily to get to, to have feedback, but I, I do feel that once I do, um, have those conversations, um, a bit of a weight is lifted off of my shoulders. Um, but it, it really is different for everyone, but, um, really, um, recognizing what works for you. Um, and, um, this is really just from a human standpoint, but I do find that, by establishing, um, kind of those, uh, mechanisms, it does really help me once I do step onto the field to be more light, um, mentally. And then I, I really am able to focus, um, on my training session or on a competition or a game. Haley, did you want to add anything to that? Um, you know, I think one of the things that I would say that athletes, I think, do really well or you're used to um, that can be adapted or I see in the business world also in medicine is that at a young age, athletes um, are often you, you get told every day what you're doing wrong. So you grow up learning to adapt and understand what criticism is. And I really noticed this when I went into medical school. Uh, I was quite a bit older than many of the other med students, but um you know, in medicine, you get told every day what you're doing wrong too, because you're constantly failing forward and you need to improve. And for those students that could handle that, they seem to, you know, spring forward. And for, for those that couldn't, it was really, it really buried them. And so the ability to understand that you're not what you do is a really important thing in life. And to know that, you know, yes, I'm an athlete, I'm a high performer, I want to win. But at the end of the day, when I go home, I'm a mom, I have a million other things that I'm doing, and I can separate the two. And when I was a younger athlete, I couldn't do that. As an older athlete, I learned how to do that. It's a really important skill to be able to have. But I think the resiliency is an incredibly important skill. And sometimes we have to go through hard times to be able to build that critical layer and not listen to the critical opinion of others, but be able to, to handle those things because uh, you know, life is not always easy and, and fun as we all know. So I think that athletes do that really, really well. And that's why they're able to um, rebound and come back from a lot of setbacks. And Ashley referenced having outlets and, and referenced different people around her, whether it was coaches, partners, friends, what role did other people play in your ability to build that resilience versus it being internal? 
Yeah. So just, you know, when I was a, a child, it was my mom and dad, my parents were teachers and they believed that a little girl could do anything a little boy could do, but they also insulated me uh, from incredible criticism and obstacles many times trying to play a male dominated sport at that time, which, you know, I was not always wanted, but at the same time, I also had to go through uh, a lot of very difficult things, taunts from parents, you know, verbal uh, abuse constantly. Uh, and I learned at a young age to, to not listen to that critical opinion of others. It had to come from within as much as I was sheltered. But I think having um, a support system is incredibly important. You can't do it alone. And one of the things that I love about team sport is, you know, whenever I go to the Olympics and I think about the Beijing Olympics right now, I always would at the games would to, to deflect pressure from myself, I would always say, you know what, there's 19 other people on this team. I don't have to do it all myself. And I would talk to myself in that way and, and sort of make bargains with myself to get through difficult times to handle pressure. I think as an individual athlete, I don't know how those tennis players cope with uh, that pressure, but there certainly is, there's ways that you learn how to cope and manage the pressure that pressure has to come and pressure has to go. It cannot be sustained or, or anyone would break under those circumstances. Yeah, thank you. All right, gentlemen, let's flip it over to you. And I'd like to hear some parallels between what Haley and Ashley have said um, relative to the sports world and being an, a high performance athlete. Um, we've also got some questions. Um, if only 15% of employees feel their company is doing enough and the issue of mental health is so prevalent, what's going to make companies do more? Does it have to be tied to the bottom line? You know, how does Lulu look at this internally? What um, what evidence is there to to show um, employee employers that this is an important thing to do? Referencing you know the Leafs as a great example. Um, so Stephen and Calvin, I want to turn it over to you to just riff a little bit on the parallels in the business world and and some of these pieces. And um, Calvin is off mute, so you get to go first. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Um, well, one, I think the parallels of just hearing um, both Haley and Ashley uh, and what I've always felt between business and sport um, is so profound. Uh, like uh, sport, um, you know, we want to win uh, and how we win is through our greatest asset, which is our teams made up of individuals. So um, it's so important that how they perform and that they can perform the best that as a business, we, we take that as our number one priority. Um, and it really does start with culture. Uh, at Lululemon, we have a culture very much rooted in connection and believing that uh, uh, to invest in the whole person. So as leaders and managers, it's important to take time to develop real connections with your team, to always be aware and understand how somebody is doing. Uh, our sort of mantra is winning uh, matters, but how we win matters more. And we want to win through uh, through others. And that means really connecting with them uh, at the at the human level, understanding, uh, you know, what could be preventing them from performing their best. So to me, one of the greatest comparisons and what I've seen through multiple different business cultures I've grown up is a lot of times leaders are promoted um, because of results, um, not necessarily how they get those results. Uh, and we really want to be a place where people come to grow and develop as leaders. So we put a ton of emphasis on committing to leadership development as well as how the results are achieved and trying to achieve um, individuals to, to, to adopt a philosophy that uh, at the end of it is really connecting uh, with the individuals and the team members to understand um, what they need to be more successful. And then as a business, making sure that we have set up the support mechanisms to both reward that as well as make it uh, available to them. So over the past year, investing in industry leading mental well-being training and other benefits to our employees globally and just doing more of that. But it's really putting leadership as uh, the critical development factor inside the organization and developing leaders uh, through a philosophy of winning through others and putting that individual first and understanding the whole person. And it starts as simple as it sounds with connecting, connecting with them uh, at, uh, at their level and understanding what they need to be successful. Love it. Steven. Yeah. Let me start maybe building off Calvin's last point around leaders. And I think there's a direct parallel with the, uh, athletic world around coaches. I mean, I think about when you get on an airplane and the first thing you hear about when the oxygen masks come down, 
put it onto yourself, first of all. And I think, you know, we've got to make sure that we're giving leaders out there the tools and the support and the resources to help themselves, first of all, and help all the employees. We know that 55% of leaders would say that they believe their career would be hurt if they talked about their mental health issues. So we've got to continue to eliminate that stigma. We've got to put in place tools because we know that's a front line of listening to people in addition to peers um, as you get forward. We also know from our research that organizations that have any programs in place, so you don't need to go you know, to the gold standard that maybe Lululemon has, you can work your way there. But if you can just put something in place and provide some support that employees have somewhere to reach out to on a confidential basis in a way to do it, we know that through the pandemic, any employees who would say that their employer has any help and support at all are substantially better than those that aren't. And the other thing I would say is, I think this is in an odd way going to take care of itself. And I think organizations are going to get on the same page as what Calvin just talked about, because we're into a war for talent. We know that in Canada alone, there's 1,100 people turning 65 every day. That's north of 12,000 down in the U.S. We know that people are retiring. We know that through the pandemic, people have chosen to do different things with their lives. And we are going to end up at a shortage of workers. And we are just going to need to make sure that we're supporting them. And it's way cheaper to provide the support to keep those people and make sure they're productive every single day than to have have to go out and look for new people. And frankly, that's just way better for society. And if we're gonna be leaders in Canada in terms of making a difference in the world and punching above our weight in the same way that our athletes have done, you know, we just got to make sure that we take care of everyone in society. The one other thing I would say, building off of one of Haley's points from before, when you look at Gen Z, we know that they're 25% more likely to ask for help than any other generation. And frankly, I think it's probably because they're used to putting their feelings out there on Facebook. And then the other thing we also know that when they get help and when they reach support mechanisms, they're 50% more likely to listen than what other generations were. So we've got a wonderful foundation. We just got to eliminate stigma. We got to make sure there's support out there and we've got to make sure people know that it's there. Thanks, Stephen. There's there's actually, I'm going to pick up on this, a question that came in for you and, and maybe you've shared some of this, but let's put it out there anyway. Um, thanks for sharing the sobering statistics in dealing with challenges for mental health. What are the qualities or characteristics that we have to change either in ourselves or in our work? And I love this. I think, you know, how we work, what we do in work, we, we really have to stop and think about some of the ways we work and what, what that's doing to us. What are those qualities or characteristics that will help us address the mental health challenges for the third of the population you referenced? Yeah, so I would start with, I think number one is we do have to take care of ourselves first. And I do think mental health doesn't stand on its own. It's about total well-being. Calvin referenced this, but it's about, you know, making sure you're connected socially. We know people are better off when they have friends, they have support mechanisms around them. It's making sure that you look after yourself physically. So don't sit in front of Zoom 12 hours a day, get out, go for walks have walking meetings, you know, there's direct element between physical fitness and mental health and how those things come together. And there's also one around financial health and make sure you're thinking about not causing extra stresses by not having budgets, by getting into debt, everything like that. So I think there's a ton that we can do in that frame just to support our health ourselves as we get into it. And then when you think about being there for others, I think, you know, when you connect with other people, really listen. Don't just listen for the, how's your day? Good. Okay, move on. But ask that next level question, right? And figure out how people are truly doing and I really caring. And, you know, I know athletes do a pretty good job of it. And I think maybe we can do a better job in some of the other worlds out there as well. I just think we've got a real opportunity to make a difference, make sure no one's left behind in society. And it really is about being out there. It's about listening. It's about understanding. And frankly, I think from a business standpoint, this is my CEO hat. Um, it's fantastic for business. If you're able to keep people at work, have them productive and have them 
passionate about what they do and the purpose of what they do every day, life becomes really, really easy. No one joins a workforce to drive more revenue or anything like that. They do it because they believe in it and they want to make a difference in the world. And if you can rally around your purpose, and it's great that Calvin started that way, if you can rally around your purpose, your people will as well. Can you talk, um, you know, the sense of purpose has come up a couple of times and, and you've talked about it at the corporate level. I'd love to hear, you know, really from any of you, but Haley and Ashley, maybe too, from a, the perspective of it in sport, how did or did a sense of purpose either for you individually or in the context of your team, how did that play into helping you stay grounded, helping you with your overall well-being and your, your, your mental health? If at all. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, yeah, I think that uh, purpose does help a lot. Um, right away, I thought back to um, uh, Tokyo with uh, the national team and um, the, the culture that we were really able to establish um, set by our head coach um, was reassuring. And I think um, to really go towards a goal as a group, um, with athletes, um, by your side is, um, one of the most powerful things. Um, and, um, having just in the intention, um, helps with, um, with motivation, um, and, and helps with just, uh, getting through, uh, the hard times as well. Um, but, um, I think, for me, uh, I always think about um, the feeling that I have when I'm out on, on the field. Um, I think back to when I first started um, and it really is liberating, um, just brings me joy. And so I'm um, very just grateful to have that feeling um, playing the sport that I love. Um, but yeah, I think that um, the intention is really the driving force behind everything. And um to have that as a group um, in a competition, um, I think it's very powerful. Yeah, I guess I would just build on that by by saying, you know, with the the women's national hockey team, uh, when I started, I was I was 15 years old. I was my first roommate was a 30. I was a 15 year old math grade 10 math student. My first roommate <laughs> was a 35 year old grade 10 math teacher, Margot Page. So the <laughs> diversity in the population and French and English, all walks of life, um, different uh, upbringings, different lifestyles, no different than the business world. So when you throw all these people together, uh, the only way that you really can get on common ground sometimes is when you have a common common goal. And for us, it's obviously very easy. We need to go and win a gold medal at the Olympics. There's no other option there and there's no other goal. But by by having that, that purpose and constantly redirecting towards that purpose helps a lot. I think the other thing that's really important too is uh, to celebrate the little successes along the way. I feel like in life in general, we don't really do that enough. When we work in teams, we we're, we we celebrate when we hit the sales target or we we win the gold medal and the big goal. But there's so many little things along the way to bring joy every single day that you have to have fun. And I think a little bit that's been lost in this pandemic is is just bringing people back to that connection to to have fun and have enjoyment and get back together as a group. And that's one of the best ways. Uh, you know, for all the team building that you can do, some of the best team building that I've ever been a part of is just taking the coach's credit card and going out and having a great night with your team and seeing what happens the next day. So, you know, just having fun is a real big part of purpose and and uh, collective mental health. I'm I'm glad our, uh, our our producer put the the big screen on so you could see everybody's faces. I mean, when you were talking, Haley. For the audience, there were so many, Calvin was nodding, Stephen was smiling, Ashley was sort of leaning in, like these points are really resonating about the celebrations, the fun, um, all of that stuff. And so I think, you know, really these standard things are pretty important for us to not lose sight of. Um, The one last thing we probably have time for, I think I want to go into, there's a question, and I've been thinking about this a lot myself, that relates to the pressure of success and, you know, the importance of winning. And I think about, I, I, I spoke to a a world-class athlete who talked once about how the way, you know, they were very driven by winning and 
the way they originally trained was, you know, 13 hours a day, go, go, go to make that happen. They ultimately changed the way they work and um, the way they trained and cut back to, it was something like five or six hours a day, just radically different and suddenly started performing better. But a lot of that, you know, I need to train more, do more was driven by this need for success. I think about it in the business world where, you know, everything's a great idea and we try to do it all. We want to, in, in my environment, we want to serve our clients. I'm sure Calvin, everybody's got a new idea for a great product that they want to put out and get it out faster and make it happen sooner. And um, how do we balance this pressure for performance and growth? How do we say no? What are some of those trade-offs that we make? And what have you seen um, in your environments that have worked well that way? Or, or do you just keep pushing? How, how do we sustain this pressure for gold medal performance? I'm going to go with a brief moment of silence to see if anybody wants to dive into that one. Kathy, I'm happy to jump in just quickly. I mean, we've got a motto that we try and drive by, which is fewer, bigger, better. And it's just a belief that if you're trying to do everything, you won't do a great job at them. And if you can really focus on what are the one or two most important things, that gives everybody permission to kind of say no to other things that might be getting in the way. And you might come to them after that next thing or something. But I do think you having focus makes it easier on people, both from a mental health standpoint, from a balance standpoint. And I think people can get aligned and get excited behind something as well. I love that concept of focus. Um, if you If you do a little Google search on the word priority, what you find out is that by definition, when people started using the word priority, it was singular. There was no plural of the word priority. It went back to Latin and it had to do with the first thing, the prior thing, as if I understand correctly. And I find it ironic that now we will go into organizations who have a list of 20 priorities, even 10 priorities, right? So um, Calvin, maybe you can talk in your world about how you make some of these difficult choices. How has Lulu or has it had to say no to something and, and, and what's the implication of that? Yeah, I feel like I have the eyes of the entire organization, um, especially my management team right now, because uh, it, it is it is the greatest one of the greatest challenges we have. And it's for all the reasons you said uh, we have an ambitious, uh, you know, goal uh, and vision of what we want to create. Um, there's exciting momentum uh, behind the business. There's such potential we can do in so many areas and to rationalize and try to identify the key areas, I think is really rooted in um, identifying uh, those that I have sort of, you know, sort of three basic, um, you know, questions, which is one is um, size of prize, right to win and difficulty of dive. Uh, and it's just one of many filters I'm sure people use to determine, should we be going after it? What is the opportunity and potential? How does it fit with the vision and, and the purpose of the organization? Uh, and then you do as leaders try to rationalize and, and, and edit that list um, and sequentially build. Uh, I, I would not pretend to have the answers on that one because I think it's, a, it's an ongoing friction within our business with high growth, big ambition across everybody wanting to do more where do you choose not to do and draw that line? Um, but I do think it, it is a healthy friction that organizations have to find. Uh, you have to push yourself and push the teams and push the enterprise. And at the same point, um, you need to know when uh, it's too much. Um, and, and I just think that's part of you know, leadership and assessing and evaluating both the risk and the opportunity in the market, as well as how much the organization is taking on the ability to execute. Are you getting, you know, sloppy in that execution? Are you doing it well, the energy level, the teams? Um, so I don't think there's a simple answer like there usually isn't in dealing with a lot of these fluid, uh, you know, scenarios. But I think as leaders, it's incumbent upon us to really find that, that balance of creating um, and, and making sure that you're managing the energy level uh, and the execution, the effectiveness across the organization. Good answer on that, Calvin. I think, you're, I think the organization will be pleased. 
Um, what I like it was that you had some idea. You basically outlined some criteria, some things to help you focus and to help you say yes or no, and to help you guide where you're going. It's interesting because I've actually tried lately, and I'm the classic A type, I confess. But I've tried uh, more recently saying no to things when somebody says, "I, you know, can you? I need this. I need it now." And actually saying, "I, I'd be happy to do this. It's something that I think is really important." And no, we can't do it now. And so if that means that we can't do it at all, then I'm willing to do that. And it's really amazing. The response we've gotten, which in many cases has been fine. We'll wait. Let's just do it when we're able to do it. And so having that psychological safety to just be able to say no within the con construct of those criteria that you set out or the one or two things that are important. Ashley and Haley in the, in the athletic world, in the sporting world, is it easier because there's one clear vision, which is winning the gold or or is it equally hard? And what what can we take away from there? I mean, Haley, we we know in your life today you have multiple things on the go, so maybe there's some some things you can compare there as well. I, yeah, I, I think I think it's 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 easier in the sense of when you have a team and you're striving towards one thing, it's often a short term situation. So for the women's national hockey team, every four years we centralize for eleven months in Calgary, which means you leave your life for. A, better part of 11 months and you train like a professional NHL team to, to head to the Olympic games, to try to try to win in the non-Olympic years, you're getting pulled together and, and pulled apart for, for different uh, events. I think similar, it's similar in soccer as well, but um, you know, so it is easier in some ways, but it's also a challenge because every individual has their own uh, priorities. You know, everybody wants to play well, everybody wants ice time, everybody wants, you know, to has different goals about what they want to achieve. But I do think that at the end of the day, we've always done a really good job, which is rooted in why we've had success through the years in, you know, at the end of the day, everybody leaves their sort of their egos and their competing interests behind and you pull together for the common goal, which is to try to win for the, for the country. Um, and I think when you, when you're able to do that, when you're able to galvanize people, then, then you do have your best chance of success. And I've always found that the best way to do that is to be really upfront and authentic in the dialogue and in the approach with people. Like I, uh, I, I don't love conflict as a leader is not something that I'm naturally good at, nor do I like, but there were, have been a number of times through the years where I've had to you know, pull a teammate aside and say, Hey, look, like we really need you. I don't know what's going on, but you know, you know, we, if we're going to win, you're a huge part of this. And often you get to the root of things. And I think having the, that dialogue and we called it coffee table conversation or dining room table talk, where you could just be open and honest with each other is a way to really develop that authentic leadership and the care ability that people have to want to do well for each other in an organization. Love it. That concept of dialogue seems to be another thread that's coming through this, this conversation. Ashley, anything you, you want to add on that? Or shall I go on to my final question? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing because um, it's true there are, there are a lot of similar parallels with um, the women's hockey team and women's soccer. Um, but also um, when we're not preparing for um, an Olympic Games or a World Cup, a major competition, a lot of us are in our respective environments in our professional environments. And um, I think for uh, for myself, um, earlier on in my career, um, there was a lot of opportunities um, beyond the field. Um, speaking engagements uh, are just um, um, th- things of that nature. And I would always say yes. Um, even if I was um, tired, um, I didn't really feel like it. I always felt like I had to, um, or else I'd be missing out on an opportunity. But I really did have to manage um, saying yes and no. And it was a really hard thing for me to do, but, uh, I was really able to understand, um, being, making the decisions, um, and being more efficient on things that I decided to do. Um, and so that was, yeah, hard. Um, but I think it's important, um, especially managing, um, managing your career. Um, you have to make those decisions, um, for yourself. That's a great example. Thank you. So I do think we have time for one more question. Um, Audience, thank you so much for all of the questions that you've put in. It's made it a much more interesting dialogue. Um, I apologize that we weren't able to have time to get to all of them. The last one I'm going to throw out to all four of you, 
um, we, we sort of started with the concept of um, personal, uh, you know, why is this personal to you? Um, let's go around and uh, do one quick thing about what do you personally do um, for yourself to help maintain your own personal mental health? And therefore, as, as you referenced, Stephen, you know, the importance of you in your leadership role, bring the best of yourself to the organization. And again, I'll pause briefly and we'll see who wants to come off mute first to answer that one. Stephen, you get it. Sure, happy to jump in. Um, I'll go two, but they're kind of related. So one is I replaced my commute in the morning with actually walking my dog. And I started after the pandemic with jumping in and doing calls immediately. And I said, this is crazy. Why not get out and get some fresh air and get the mind moving and getting a chance to think a little bit. Um, I do think you've got to, as I said before, put that oxygen mask on. So I would just say to everyone, make sure that you think about yourself and make sure you get the right balance. And that can be physical fitness. It can be making sure you keep friends around you, making sure you stay connected socially and making sure you don't sit in front of a Zoom all day, but mix it up with uh, video calls and phone calls and walking meetings and things like that. But I think we've just got to look after ourselves, take care, and then we'll be there for others. Another example of the dog walking. I've heard that one lots. It's a great one. Ashley, let's let's go to you. What one thing do you do for yourself? Um, well, one thing that I do is um, daily, I take... 10 minutes or it can vary, but, um, and it's kind of like meditation, but I basically, um, just, I'm in like gratitude and I think of things that I'm basically grateful for, and it can be starting out my day that way or throughout the day or ending my day, but I always make it a point to do that. And I find that especially when I start my day out, um, whether I'm in a good or bad mood, um, it does really change, um, um, the, just the aspect, um, I find that I'm a lot lighter. Um, my interactions are better and it it is a spiral effect. I think when you can get yourself into that headspace, it's not necessarily just being in a good mood. I think it's really, um, thinking about, um, um, things that, um, that we're really privileged and fortunate to have, like even just being able to eat, having clean water, little things like that. And it can change every day, but I do, really make it um, an important um, point to do that uh, on a daily basis. Love it. Kelvin, your turn. Um, I think there's been a lot today about recovery um, and a big component of recovery is sleep. So it's just one area that for me, um, I never used to take as serious and uh, necessary as I do today. And it is one of those that I really try to you know, maintain a, a commitment to getting the right amount of sleep and recovery in order to perform, be it at work or you know, with my personal passion of fitness or with the family as a father and a husband. So um, recovery and sleep is definitely one that I prioritize um, and make sure that I do as good a job as I can to maintain. I, I know so many people who have the book, Why We Sleep on their book. It's, so, it cha- it's like the game changer to health. It does what, you know, uh, yeah. a view on sleep for sure. Absolutely. It, it, it had an impact on me. And Haley, um, you get to wrap us up with this question. Yeah, well, well, Calvin kind of uh, said what I was thinking as well. So, um, you know, when I when I started uh, where I was finishing medical school, I, we do this clerkship rotations and I we were working at 26 hour shifts. And uh, this one shift in particular, I I worked 26 hours with 20 minutes sleep. I went to the bathroom once and I had an apple and that was it. And at the end of it, I realized this is insanity. And this is completely crazy. And I, I never in my life would ever have done that as an athlete, because as an athlete, you covet your sleep and your rest and your nutrition. All those things are so sacred. We actually call it like the disease of me because you have to worry about yourself all the time. And so when I stepped into the real world, I realized, oh my God, people don't do this. <laughs> and I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to, I'm going to take everything I learned from being an athlete and try to protect 
my sleep uh, and my fitness as much as possible. So for me, rest, rest is a weapon. I try to get as much sleep as I can. Even if I have to work, I try to make up for it uh, the, the night that I don't. And uh, I do try to train six days a week. Even if I have to do stairs in the middle of the night in the hospital, it's that important to me because that's what keeps my my mind going as well. So these things are are really crucial, and I, I'm grateful that as an athlete, I learned what that was like, and and uh, I'll take that with me through the rest of my life. Otherwise, I'd probably be a puddle. So, uh, sleep and fitness. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am truly grateful to use your word, word, Ashley, for the opportunity to to moderate with the the four of you and and the Canada Club. I know. In classic Kathy Wood's work, I've managed to take a slightly over time. I seem to do that with all of our conversations. And so with that, I will turn it back to Tracy to wrap us up. And, and thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. We're delighted to have you take us over time with that kind of conversation. Um, to Ashley, Stephen, Calvin, and Haley, um, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for your leadership in this space. Um, I was um, impressed by some of the commonalities in the comments each of the four of you made, whether that's you know resiliency or connection or attention to the whole person. You know, we heard from the athletes Haley and Ashley in that regard, but also from uh, Calvin and Stephen as leaders at LifeWorks and Lululemon. So thank you, Kathy, for so ably um, leading the conversation and, and working in as many questions as you did. Um, Thank you to our sponsors again, obviously, uh, Cadillac Fairview, Deloitte and LifeWorks for making this possible. We appreciate your support very much. Thank you to our AV supplier, Ben Valkenberg Communications and to livemeeting.ca for making it possible for us to gather virtually today. Um, I hope that um, all the people out there will join us for some of our upcoming events. On February 9th, we'll be joined by Burke Clark from the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario and Arashe Jethalal from CEM Benchmarking for a discussion of their recent report um, called A Case for Scale, which is quantifying how large institutional investors add value. And on February 10th, uh, a conversation which may tie uh, well into the one we just had today, um, we will be hosting the Honourable Seamus O'Regan, Federal Minister of Labour, for a discussion on the government's plan to support workplace mental health and position Canada for strong recovery post-pandemic as as Stephen was referencing. To learn more about the upcoming events, because I'll stop listing them now, um, please go to our website at canadianclub.org. You can browse um, archives, you can check out um, our new membership categories, and maybe consider becoming a member to support the club's work. So guests, thank you again so much for joining us. And uh, for all of the members and participants out there, please stay healthy and safe. Thank you.